Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. During the True False Documentary Film Festival in Columbia, directors from around the world gather to screen their films and talk about their craft. Our program today features a condensed version of one of the film forums, sponsored by the Lee Hills Chair in Free Press Studies here at the Journalism School. The discussion relates to filming in countries with repressive regimes, such as Russia under Vladimir Putin. Two panelists recently made documentaries shot in Moscow and screened at the festival. Each focuses on anti-Kremlin protesters. Maxine Postorovkin, director of Pussy Riot, A Punk Prayer, and Askold Kirov, co-director of Winter Go Away, are two of the panelists. Others are Tinatin Gerciani, director of a film shot in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, and Madeline Sackler, director of Unstable Elements, which premieres next month at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York City. Sackler's film documents members of an underground resistance group, a theater production company in Belarus, as they rebel against the dictatorship of Alexander Lukashenko. In this clip from the movie trailer, a woman describes living in tyranny while a journalist talks about rigged elections and getting sent to prison. For the last 16 years, we live under the last dictatorship of Europe. No media, everything is controlled by the government, uh, all branches of power are under control of the president. All articles of universal declaration of human rights are violated in Belarus. People are kidnapped and killed. У меня закрыли три газеты, до этого закрыли галерею, потом закрыли три газеты, в которых, которыми я руководил. Потом сидел в тюрьме. When he was detained, he was kept in a very small cell. It's called stone glass. You cannot move. There is no water. Amnesty International recognized this as a torture. The government doesn't recognize the free theater. They can't sell tickets. They can't rent space. And they can't openly promote their plays. And they're hounded by the KGB, the Belarus version of the Secret Service. Most members of the theater have lost their state jobs. And all have been imprisoned. Sackler says they managed to smuggle about a terabyte of footage out of the country. The panel discussion is moderated by Dana O'Keefe, director of a short film called Vladimir Putin in Deep Concentration. O'Keefe asks Madeline whether the film could end up causing harm to the subjects in Belarus. I think in a way, actually, uh, hopefully the film will be protecting, protecting the people in it. Um, <laughs> talked about this a little bit last night, but in a way, uh, I think journalists are um, really the biggest advocates for people uh, going through these situations. And so often they'll find that if they get arrested and then there's a piece that's published internationally, they'll be released more quickly. So hopefully it'll be the, the opposite. Both of the Russian documentaries feature Pussy Riot, a feminist punk rock band, the women wear brightly colored dresses and ski masks, or balaclavas, and they stage unauthorized guerrilla performances in public places. The musicians became famous internationally last year after crashing services at a cathedral in Moscow and performing an anti-Putin anthem. <laughs> This is the beginning of the music video of the performance, which was posted on the internet 
and entitled Punk Prayer, Mother of God, Chase Putin Away. The women said their protest was directed at the Orthodox Church leader's support for Putin during his election campaign. But three members were arrested, denied bail, and charged with hooliganism, allegedly motivated by religious hatred. And two of them remain in prison, serving the second half of their two-year sentences. O'Keefe asks about the distribution of documentaries now that the digital technology allows footage to be easily shared over the Internet through programs such as BitTorrent. Uh, I think a film will be seen probably, and we're, we're talking about doing a screening at, in May. Has been. I mean, I think in Russia, be, with, with Pussy Riot specifically, because it's such a big story, and it is, plays out like a soap opera in a lot of, uh, in Russia. So I think that it will be seen. I wanted to add one, uh, um, one point to Madeline's, is I think that one of the, and this maybe goes back to the new media question, is that in a lot of these places that don't have distribution networks in place for art house or opposition type cinema, people tend to be very savvy with things like torrent, bit torrent technology and all these other things. So there is distribution of, of that. And, and I saw your film on, on bit torrent. So <coughs> that's, that's the new Samizdat. Yeah, that's, that is the new Samizdat. No. And, and maybe just for the benefit of the, the audience, you could talk a little bit more specifically about the current situation with the, you know, the, the members of Pussy Riot and where things stand with their legal proceedings, just because I think um, it's something people are very curious about. Well, uh, Masha and Nadia are, are still in jail in two separate colonies. They have about a, uh, a little bit over a year left in their sentence. It's somewhat doubtful. They have several appeals pending, but it's somewhat doubtful whether they'll be um, eligible for early release because of various kinds of violations that they were uh, charged with. Actually, just the other day, I think Nadia was uh, punished for something for walking without supervision in the camp, and that would prevent her from getting early release. But uh, yes, yeah, so technically they would be released March 3rd of next year. And what, if any, political impact do you anticipate the film would or might have on that situation? Is it likely that, you know, that, that, that the increased visibility and awareness that either the film, the film creates would exert pressure on the regime to... Um, I mean, I th the only conceivable way I could see is, um, is by virtue of having it more visible. I think that the only context would be with the Sochi Olympics coming up and there would be international pressure in, um, in connection to that. So, I mean, in terms of the film, I think it would continue already kind of a mass attention that the case have, had attracted. So I think it, only in this way that it, if it continues to be this case that refuses to go away to the annoyance of a government, which was actually the case from the beginning. I think that it had the government known that it would grow into this big thing, they probably wouldn't have pursued it at, at the outset, or, or they wouldn't have decided to, right. or they would have ab abandoned the case earlier. Oskold talked about the need to protect the identity of journalists who snuck into the cathedral to film the P Pussy Riot performance. Maxime translates Oskold's comments. And so we had to think about how to, which parts we could use so as not to uh, potentially harm either the Pussy Riot members or the people filming there. Right. Because technically, like, you weren't allowed to film in the cathedral. And Да, потому что тогда шли разговоры о том, чтобы судить не только участниц Pussy Riot, но и тех, кто снимал эту акцию. Yeah, because at first there were also, um, there was talk of, um, of trying to, uh, to prosecute not just the Pussy Riot members, but also the people that kind of came in, and the journalists that came in and snuck in and filmed the, the, the action. Um, and I mean, I guess I could p piggyback on that answer. And I think it is also kind of an important difference between something like the Belarusian case and the Russian case, whereas in, I think in, in Belarus there is actually much more straight up re repression of journalists and of governments. I think in Russia the situation is slightly different, whereas for the most part there's tons of liberal newspapers and liberal cable channels and Echo Moscow and all these other things where you could openly speak and say as much negative things about Putin as you want. I think that the, the government approach is mostly through um, it's almost like a carpet bombing approach in the sense that by controlling certain federal channels, you guarantee yourself enough of an electorate. And in a way, some people make the same point about Fox News and how, 
how that works in terms of just galvanizing and kind of controlling the conservative mindset. And I think in Russia it's much more um, that, whereas the, a lot of the deaths that have come to journalists have been more specific to various investigations and the specific things like that. Is it, yeah, I want to actually just pick up on that a little bit. Is it your sense that there is a coherent strategy on the part of Putin or, or, or the Kremlin in general to deal with opposition activity or opposition journalists, or that in fact it's much more sort of ad hoc, specific agencies responding to specific threats in an uncoordinated way? Because I think sometimes there's a, there's a tendency to believe that because Putin is a strong man, that he's actually controlling everything that's going on in a, in a more strategic way than I think is actually the case. What's your sense of that? Um. My sense is that that side of it is grossly overstated in terms of how orchestrated it is. I think that it's a lot of organs doing what they believe that they're supposed to and kind of having orders from up top. But I don't think that that's, um, that it's as coordinated. And Maxim, perhaps you could sort of walk us through the genesis of, of the project, how this all sort of came to pass after the Pussy Riot action in the cathedral leading to the trial itself and the process of culling through all of this material and trying to you know, bring that story to life. Well, we started filming shortly after the arrest. I mean, I had known about them and I was in, in Moscow around the time uh, after the arrest, actually working on a different film. And um, my collaborator, Mike and I, we, we started filming and initially the film was much more, because we didn't know um, what would happen at, at the trial and whether the, the trial would be filmed, let alone what happened. Originally, I suppose the film was much more about the contextual situation around Russia and around the trial with a lot more participation from the lawyers and, and, um, and other kind of fellow activists. And, and I suppose the film changed a little bit when um, we, got this sort of treasure trove of uh, trial footage that the, the trial happened to be filmed and filmed extremely well. And also there was just sort of verite material even from the trial of the girls interacting amongst themselves. So at that point, I suppose the film changed and became much more, they came out as the stronger characters and ultimately pushed a lot of other material out of the way. The panelists were asked whether strong men like Putin and Lukashenko really care about how they're portrayed in the media including critical films such as theirs. I think that, um, that the Russian government and the Putin government is definitely, he himself is kind of incredibly obsessed with his, his own PR and his own public image, and I think he's become more obsessed over the years. Um, and I think that they do care in a certain way. I think that a lot of the rich sort of Russian elite and government, they do want to be seen as part of this kind of European bourgeois elite. And stories like this and a lot of the, the kind of the human rights violations and all those things that come out, I think throw a cog in that wheel a little bit. So I think it, 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 there is this sort of irritation and you see this, um, I think recently Angela Merkel was uh, confronted Putin about Pussy Riot and he gets very, um, I said bitchy about it, and uh, and and is, is, is so, so it isn't definitely an irritant, and a lot of these sto stories do kind of undermine this international picture that governments try to present. Я не знаю, волнует ли их собственный имидж. Они мне такое ощущение, что они все время делают вид, что они не в курсе, что происходит, и пытаются игнорировать. Это такая вот снобистская позиция и Единственный способ, который быть услышанным, нашли вот пусирают, да, они нашли эту точку в России, где можно сказать что-то и, и быть услышанным, но это очень опасно. Yeah, he's uh, as Kurt said, but for the most part, he's not sure whether um, the government really cares that much about um, about kind of what's said about them, and they, they the pretense uh, they tend to um, present themselves as being oblivious to all these things and a lot of the kind of the human rights and oppositional tendencies and the only exception being uh, Pussy Riot who found this sort of combination and managed to be heard throughout, even if uh, throughout Russia and kind of discussed, et cetera. Это вот точка, где можно общаться с Богом и с Путиным. Yeah, it's, it's that, 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 that perfect location where you can speak both to God and Putin at the same time. 
The directors discuss how media is used as a tool to influence the public. Tina Tin started by asserting that documentary films have little impact inside Georgia, where state-controlled television dominates. I think you cannot... Uh, I tried to go to jails for my film, but it was not possible, I think. Um, uh, its control is not really visible. Uh, I think uh, for, in, for inside, for all of these countries, they, uh, internal, they have uh, control on these main channels. Uh, in Georgia, for example, Rustavi too, who has this channel, he will win uh, elections. It's clear. <laughs> and, uh, and all these smaller channels on all these newspapers, they are not important. They don't have influence on society. And also, and um, I think this kind of films they need for, for a broad uh, the sign that it's, um, it's freedom, uh, a kind of me medial freedom. So we, they can do what they want, but they know uh, they can, these films cannot influence these countries from mm -hmm. inside. I mean, Madeline, in your film you see these sort of spasms of free expression that are then immediately stifled very quickly. Um, how do you sort of... Do, yeah, I mean, so I was actually going to say it's. I, I think it's not. I think it's not true that in Belarus they don't care. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few filmmakers there. There was one main documentarian whose legs were broken mm -hmm. and his house was broken into. So we were very, very careful. We only worked with uh, cinematographers that had accreditation, so that if they were stopped on the street, they would, you know, hopefully they would they would be safe. And we only had a couple of people on the streets during the very violent protests who were filming anyway for news. So they were capturing, you know, for us, just greater content that, that they would have been doing anyway. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. I think it's a little bit different maybe, you know, than, than in Russia. And so for me, that makes me sort of hopeful because I think if we are able to distribute the film there, I think it provides sort of a new access point for people and hopefully starts to create sort of more of a network and um, more people maybe can start distributing content like that. I mean, you know, we don't, we don't think that we'll be felling the dictator with the film, but I do think that it makes a difference for people to see footage like this. I think it, your, your question uh, touches upon something very interesting, and I think it's almost the question is, will be extremely important in like 15, 20 years as there is a generational shift and there's a new generation that gets access to information through these other more disparate, more dissipated channels uh, as opposed to, uh, whereas the control of the, uh, whereas the federal kind of state channels um, lose some of their influence. And I think then that's going to be the, the interesting question because I think so many of these governments are old fashioned in the way that they tend to focus on just the, the mass media, which is basically uh, the main television channels. And how, I think that that will actually be probably the single most important thing in the transition. Mm -hmm. well, you were pointing to something important too, I think, which is that, I mean, unfortunately in Belarus, like the opposition movement is very um, like centered in the cities and outside of the city there isn't access to these sort of trickles of free media that are starting to appear and the government is, is very good at tackling those trickles mm -hmm. um, so you know they'll uh, arrest people who are running the online newspapers and the filmmakers like I mentioned and so they don't kind of get out of Minsk um, and so that makes it very, very difficult for there to be larger swells of change. And I think, you know, there, I saw a lot of parallels between our two films. Um, and I think it's just like, it's, it's sad to watch because there are these sort of swells of freedom and expression. But like when people are getting arrested right after that, I mean, it's just human nature for fatigue to set in and how long can you sort of go on. So... I mean, I hope that these films sort of help, you know, re-inspire people to demand, you know, what, what they deserve because they're very brave for doing that. Я думаю, что они прекрасно понимают, что они не в состоянии контролировать информацию вообще, пока есть интернет, пока есть социальные сети и другие каналы, но они могут контролировать только большинство населения. 
So I think they're well aware of it. They can't control the information flow because as long as there's internet and so, and social networking and all these things. But mm -hmm. uh, so that's why they put the stake on uh, the ma the general population, the majority. Да, и они имеют технологии для того, чтобы нейтрализовать любую информацию. Например, вот было два фильма, рассказывающие об оппозиции, об, о митингах протеста. Там была такая концентрация лжи и рассказ о том, что люди выходят против Путина на американские деньги, там за какие-то еще, что все они шпионы и, и так далее. Они где-то снимали, как какие-то актеры получают деньги за эти митинги. Вот, вот это вот их способы, их and, методы. And the, and the main means has been to really, uh, do a lot on uh, on sort of federal TV channels to discredit the opposition. And so there's these two f f famous primetime shows, Mamatov, and, and that really aim to discredit the protest movement and to essentially recreate certain things and argue that it was all funded by the State Department and that was all these things. So there's a lot of, a, a lot of media that plays on the xenoph uh, xenophobia that exists sort of in the general population. What are strong men? There's so many strong men who have a history of being cinephiles. What's the connection between those two things? You always hear that uh, many of these sort of uh, strong men or authoritarian leaders have deeply cinematic you know, imaginations, both in terms of how they construct narratives about their regimes and present themselves, but also you hear that there's a deep connection to movies, that they're watching movies constantly. In fact, all, almost, almost every uh, major political leader, you get the sense that wa they watch a lot of movies. What's the connection between these things? That's something that's always fascinating to me. It's always like, because Lenin, uh, it's funny, Lenin was not a cinephile. Lenin did not watch hardly any movies. He didn't really like them. I mean, he talked about cinema a little bit. Stalin watched absolutely everything. And Stalin gave very strange notes to people as well for, uh, for the, the movies. I don't know, what the, I don't think Putin watches that, that, that many. He doesn't seem like a cinephile. But, but Stalin would give, uh, the most famous example is when Eisenstein and Cherkasov would, uh, they were called to Stalin, and Stalin, he had some notes on Ivan the Terrible. The first one was that Ivan's beard was like a centimeter too long, and then the second one was that when Ivan kisses his wife, it goes on for two and a half seconds longer than it should. Mm -hmm. and, and all these other things. But then there's, of course, King Jong-il was a big, is a big fan of... Lukashenko, big film buff? I don't know. <laughs> I can, do you know? I have no I idea. idea. But Putin likes to make his own films of himself doing things, carrying on in the Siberian wilderness and so on. I mean, it's oh, a, right, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Kremlin press office is very, you know, has a very elaborate conception of this image that they like to present of Putin. There was also a romantic comedy about him called A Kiss Not for the Press. Uh, <laughs> that, that was that played in, in big theaters. Was. No, Putin считает себя сам себя очень креативным. Он в одном из интервью признался, что он сам придумывает вот эти вот акции полет. С, со стерхами или доставание этих древнегреческих амфор с дна моря. Well, uh, uh, Putin sort of sees himself as very creative, and in one interview he admitted that, he, uh, that a lot of uh, the kind of public relations things, whether it's like flying with the cranes or pulling out these ancient vases from the bottom of a lake, that he that he came up with ideas himself. <laughs> staging these. During the question and answer portion of the forum, an audience member asked about the government's control of the internet and how it spies on dissidents. Madeline answers first. In Belarus, they definitely are. Um, so they, um, they manipulate the internet in lots of ways. So like on the night of the election, they actually shut down all of the cell phones and, and access to the internet for that night, so nobody could tweet or, or Facebook or email or, or even call each other. Um, and then they they definitely are are tracking emails, um, and they they're pretty sure that they're monitoring Skype as well. Although there hasn't been proof. There's a rumor going around. I don't know actually know if this is true, but um, that Lukashenko was trying to work out how to buy the Chinese firewall. Um, so I don't know. We'll see what what that means. But I mean, my impression has been, and this is actually from doing. Um, Filming another film that kind of has a lot of uh, secret military stuff in Russia that, that probably should be monitored. But the 
that the services, like the special the intelligence services, tend to be kind of behind the times, and they still operate in a world that's sort of 15 or 20 years behind. So my impression is that they're not as media savvy as they should, I mean, as they should be. And I think that even like the spy scandal in, in New York, when they were, if you actually look at what those people were doing, they were, you know, getting paid, and I, I imagine well, for, for basically publicly available information that anyone could have, um, but, so I mean, I think that internet access and internet piracy and the use of internet is very rampant, and Russians tend to be very good at, at, at using it for various ends. Another moderator asks the directors how authoritarian governments are using social media to discredit opponents. To what extent, I mean, you said you know, the Russian um, security services are very much behind the times in controlling the internet. That's certainly true by comparison with the Chinese who were, who were on that right from the start. Um, to what extent is the government itself using new media to discredit people, right? I mean, there was this whole flurry of incidents where journalists were being caught in sort of honey trap, uh, you know, videotape things, and they would circulate those on the internet. I mean, to what extent is there kind of a war between artists using new media and the government sort of wading into this as well? One thing I noticed while filming Pussy Rat was that um, a lot of the protests, the cops and the riot squad would have their own cameraman. And so a lot of times there would be, like I remember one um, night there was a little mini protest outside the jail where the girls were being held. And uh, there was like, it was one of the, uh, it was Gaite's 30th birthday and there was fireworks set off. But the police had their own cameraman that was filming the protester. So in a way, it's this trying to always create a media counterweight of evidence. Um, for what was filmed, I think, on other, um, mm -hmm. on other sort of cameras. They do that here, too, though. Mm -hmm. You see police mm -hmm. at rallies filming people. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, not though. Oh, yeah, we've I occupied. Guess, and... did that a ton, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maxime went on to say that repression in Russia now seems to be just reflexive. A lot of the repressive tendencies aren't actually necessary, for, uh, at least in Russia, for the, the government to do. I think that they would be perfectly fine if they didn't do it, but I think that it's because of where the people in the government come from and that they do come from sort of an older, more Soviet backgr uh, background where there was kind of harsher punishment for hooliganism, and there's just a way of treating dissent that was very different in those times, that they're almost on autopilot to a certain extent in in reacting to these things. And I think that they would probably be, I don't think that they would lose power as a result if they did not kind of stifle the opposition. The panel discussion, Strong Men and Dissidents, took place in March during the True False Film Fest. You can listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcasts at globaljournalist.org, where you can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to our program. Please send us questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbia.org or our Facebook page. You could also follow us on Twitter at globaljourn. That's global, J-O-U-R-N. Our program is produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer. Thanks to the True False Fest and Columbia Access Television for providing forum footage. Just ahead is Free Press Watch. Please join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed.